let's uh, pray, and then we'll get into week two of Ruth's A Christmas Story. God, thank you for your word and the way that you work through it. I pray that as we take a look at Ruth chapter two today and the life of Boaz and learn some lessons about what it means to be a righteous person, I pray that you would use this to help us to apply it to our lives and live the way you've called us to live, to treat others the way you've called us to treat others, and to be the people that you've saved us and redeemed us to be. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so here we are, week two. Uh, Ruth, a Christmas story. It's going to take us four weeks total. Um, and we're going to see how God used the people and the events in the book of Ruth to prepare the way for the coming of Christ at Christmas. And so uh, last week we saw that uh, both of these events, Ruth returned with Naomi to Bethlehem and that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And it's not a coincidence. In fact, um, you can make the argument that the reason that Jesus was born in Bethlehem at Christmas is because of what took place here in the book of Ruth, making that the hometown that they had to come to to pay their taxes for the census and whatever else. And so, um, and, and by the time the New Testament comes around. And so, uh, there are a lot of parallels between the book of Ruth, uh, between the, the person of Ruth in the book of Ruth, and between Mary in the Christmas story. We looked at some of those. And we, uh, we focused on these two women last week. Well, today... Uh, we're going to focus on the men of the story. Now listen, we described the book of Ruth as uh, the story of a woman who, who uh, committed herself to, in faith to follow God and, and went to Bethlehem where she gave birth to a child that would change the course of the world. And that's a fair description of the book of Ruth. I think you can also describe it as... Um, uh, the story of a righteous man who offered kindness and protection and provision to a young woman in her time of need. And really, at the end, it's where the, the, those two stories intersect. It's what we have in the story of the book of Ruth. So, last week we worked our way through the whole first chapter. We're going to do the same thing today with the second chapter. I'm going to do my best to push through this, okay? But it's a whole chapter, and there's just a lot in here. And so, we'll see how it goes, all right? Um, let's, read, let's read Ruth chapter 2. It says, Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone else, or anyone in whose eyes I find favor. This was a practice known as gleaning. And the, and the Old Testament law provided for this. Naomi said to her, Go ahead, my daughter. So she went out and entered a field and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they answered. Boaz asked the overseer of his harvesters, Who does that young woman belong to? And the overseer replied, She is the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She came into the field and has remained here from morning until now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz said to Ruth, My daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field, and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting, and follow along after the women. I've told the men not to lay a hand on you. And whenever you're thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground, and she asked him, Why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother in your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servants. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come over here, have some bread, and dip it in the wine vinegar. When she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. As she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to his men, let her gather among the sheaves and don't reprimand her. 
even pull out some stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up and don't rebuke her. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. Then she threshed the barley she had gathered and it amounted to about an ephah. She carried it back to town and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered. Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over after she had eaten enough. Her mother-in-law asked her, where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one at whose place she had been working. The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz, she said. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. She added, that man is our close relative. He is one of our guardian redeemers. I grew up hearing that as kinsman redeemer. It's the same thing, and that's what our message next week is about, is the kinsman redeemer. Then Ruth the Moabite said, He even said to me, Stay with my workers until they finish harvesting all my grain. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It will be good for you, my daughter, to go with the women who work for him, because in someone else's field you might be harmed. So Ruth stayed close to the women of Boaz to glean until the barley and wheat harvests were finished, and she lived with her mother-in-law. So when, uh, when last... Uh, we saw Ruth and Naomi last week in chapter 1. They had just returned to Bethlehem and they had nothing. And remember they had, uh, Naomi had moved to Moab during the time of famine in Bethlehem and with her husband and her two sons, her husband Elimelech, her sons Malon and Kilion, who by the way, uh, we talked about this a little bit, the importance of names and, and Naomi is pleasant and at the end she's like you know, I'm not pleasant, I'm bitter and and uh, uh, I forget what Elimelech means exactly, but, but Malon and Kilion, this is uh, not precise, but effectively their names mean sick and dying. I mean, these were not healthy boys. And, and, and so there was a lot of stock placed in names, and, and apparently justifiably so, because Elimelech had died, Malon had died, and Kilion had died, and left Naomi, Ruth, and Orpah. So Orpah stays home, uh, Naomi and Ruth moved back to Bethlehem. When Ten years earlier, when Naomi had left Bethlehem, she had a family. Now she returns as a widow, and she returns with no children. Ruth was from Moab. She had married one of these sons. When he died, she also became a widow. But she was a young widow, and so she could theoretically have easily married again there in Moab and raised a family and had a, had a future. But instead, she committed herself to the Lord. And she had faith in Him, and she chose to go back to Bethlehem with Naomi. And she understood the sacrifice, I think, that she was making. I think it was fair to assume that as a Moabite moving to Bethlehem, even as a young woman, that it was unlikely she would marry again or have a family. That was the price she was paying to be loyal to her mother-in-law and to demonstrate her faith in God. But the book of Ruth is not just a short story, it's a love story. And it's not just the story of Ruth, it's the story of Ruth and Boaz. And it's a story of faith and a story of love and of commitment. And it results in a child who's going to change the world. And the key thing we learn about Boaz in chapter 2, the most important thing is that he is a righteous man. He's a righteous man and he offers kindness, he offers protection, he offers provision to this young woman, Ruth, during her most desperate time of need. She is thoroughly alone with the exception of her mother-in-law. She is a foreigner from a godless people, from a pagan people. She has severed her ties with her family to follow God and move to Bethlehem. And Boaz treats her righteously. He treats her well because he's a righteous man. So what is a righteous man? What does it look like to be a righteous person? How does a righteous person act? And so I'm going to, I will go ahead and warn you over and over, I'm going to use the expression a righteous man, a righteous man, a righteous man. Boaz was definitely a man. He was a righteous man, but but these principles, principles apply to anyone. And so when I say righteous man, I want you to hear that uh, in, the, in the generic form, a righteous person. And so as we, as we really get to know Boaz a little bit this morning, I want us to look at 
five characteristics of righteousness in general and righteousness, a righteous man in particular that we find here in chapter 2. The first characteristic is that a righteous man puts God first in his life. We're introduced to Boaz, of course, in the beginning of verse 1. We find out he's a close relative of Naomi's husband, Elimelech, that he's a man of standing is how uh, the verse puts it, a man of standing. I love that expression. I hope one day to be a man of standing. I think that would be nice, right? The fact that he's related to Elimelech, it's going to be very important as the story progresses. It's important now, but it's really, you've got to know it now, but it really becomes very important later. And the fact that he's a man of standing, it tells us some things about him. It tells us that he has wealth, he has power, he has influence, that he has a good reputation in the community. I think we instinctively kind of know what a man of standing is. But I don't think it means the same thing to us, right? I think in our community you can be a man of standing, a person of standing, and not necessarily be a righteous person. But I think that kind of all went together in Bethlehem of that day. That it was hard to be a person of standing, a man of standing, without also being a good person. And so when you read verse 1, know that Boaz has an important part to play in this story. Verse 2, Ruth makes the decision to go to the fields to glean. And we learn that they had come to Bethlehem just in time for the beginning of the barley season, the barley harvest. And um, back in Leviticus, and God gave Israel the law, he made provision for poor people and for foreigners who would come into the, into the, to come into the fields and to what he called glean. And we still use that expression about gleaning, right? We just going to glean a little extra from... And really what it meant was the ones doing the harvest, the landowners, the ones working for them, weren't to go all the way up to the edge of the field and harvest every last stalk. It's, it's okay to leave a little around the edges. And if they're harvesting bundles of grain and some falls to the ground, just leave it. It's fine. That there are people who need that food. They they don't just they're not just given the food. They have to work for it. They have to come and get it. They have to come and harvest it themselves. But it is a gift to them. And so it's a way to provide for the poor and for the foreigner. And, and Ruth certainly qualified as both of those. And so she went out to glean. And when she does, she just so happens, you know, just coincidentally, to find herself in a field that belongs to this guy, Boaz. Now, the narrator of the story, I think, is having a little fun with us when he says... Because uh, um, we know that there's no coincidence. Since she happened to go to this field that Boaz was in, right? Or the Boaz on. We know that she didn't happen to. There's no coincidence, right? That God did this. His hand is clearly at work. In verse 4, we finally get to meet Boaz. He, he's introduced, he speaks for the first time here. It's clear, it's clear that he puts God first in his life. It's the first words we hear from him. He greets the harvesters. The Lord be with you. He's a good man. He loves God. He loves people. And the people love him back. This is reflected back. The harvesters call back a blessing to him. The Lord bless you, they call. <coughs> Do you put God first in your life? Do you treasure him above all else? Is, your, is that your wish for people? That the Lord be with you. Is that your top of mind thought for others? Is you pray God's blessing on them. You want what's best for them. And you do that because you treasure your relationship with God above everything else. A righteous person puts God first in his life. But a righteous person also uh, shows kindness to the poor. In verse 5, we come to the, to the turning point in the story, right? It's the turning point in any love story. Boy meets girl, girl meets boy, um, girl harvests grain and boy's feet. No, that's not it. But girl meets boy, boy meets boy. <laughs> There's that turning point in any love story, and that's where we come to. So Boaz is, appears, he's a wealthy landowner. He's got all these harvesters who work for him, and they're working in his fields. And he's got lots of poor people gleaning in the fields, because he had big fields, and he could, he could absorb that. And yet, with all of this activity going on in the harvest, and with all these people around, he noticed Ruth. She stood out to him. I don't know why that is. God's brought her to his attention or was there something particular about her look but he got there but he noticed Ruth and he asked his foreman about her and the foreman notice how he identifies her he doesn't call her by name 
on the Abbey. That's Ruth. You've heard about Ruth. He doesn't do that. He says that's the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. Remember we said last week how all of Bethlehem was a stir, right? Because of these two women that had come back from Moab. And so he undoubtedly knew about Naomi coming back. After all, this is the wife of a close relative of his and about Ruth having come back with her. He obviously knew the story, but he hadn't seen her yet. Who is that? Oh yeah, that's that Moabite that came back from Moab. And so that is her identity at this point. That is all anybody knows about Ruth at this point, is that she is a Moabite, she is a foreigner, she's an outsider, she does not really belong. She may be a lot of things, but she's not one of them. We get that way sometimes, don't we? About people who are different from us. Now, we've done pretty good about... You know, we're a multicultural kind of society. We've got folks around who are different ethnicities and from different places. We've done pretty good about accepting that. I really think the economic is one of the places we don't do as well with. Right? We, there are people who don't have as much, and so we that's how they become known. Oh, yeah, that's that. That's how Ruth was known. But Boaz... He didn't just notice her. He called over to her. He, he was kind to her. He encouraged her to keep gleaning in his field. Don't go to any other fields. Stay in my fields. He's told, he tells the men, his harvesters, he tells them, don't, you don't mess with her. You don't bother her. He even gives her permission to drink from the water jars that are really for the paid workers. He's providing for her. He's being kind to her. And she is astounded by this, and rightfully so. I think Ruth's very aware of who she is, right? She knows that she's a fish out of water in Bethlehem. She knows that she's a Moabite. She knows she doesn't have any kind of godly heritage. She knows that these people are followers of the one true God. And, I, and she is now, but she knows that's not part of her background. And so I think she knows how out of place she is. But here's this guy. A man of standing who shows kindness to her. He notices her. She has no way to pay him back. Like, this is not an equal kind of relationship. He is showing kindness to her. This is the way Jesus described it. He told us this is how we're supposed to live our lives. In Luke 14, starting in verse 12, he said, Jesus said to his host, He said, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, so you'll be retained. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Right? That's how Jesus told us to live our lives. Live our lives as givers. As people of generosity. People are marked by the way we care for others. Honestly, this is one of the reasons I like SHIP so much, the ministry that we support. And, and when I made that trip in September, this was really kind of driven home to me. Uh, this is especially true of their sponsorship program where they have, they have children all the way up through college students that you can sponsor on a monthly basis to help pay for their education and help them to reach a certain level of success in life they would not be able to reach otherwise, most likely. And um, and here's what I like about this. This is how it demonstrates what Jesus is saying. You're giving to people they cannot pay you back. In fact, most for most of these kids, they'll never really know who you are. Now, they'll have your name and you write letters and stuff, and they'll get to know you a little bit, but they'll never meet you in person, most likely, unless you make a trip to El Salvador, which you can do. But that's truly unselfish giving. That's what Boaz did. Boaz was a righteous man who showed kindness to the poor. The third characteristic uh, of a righteous person that we see in this chapter is that he encourages people in their walk with the Lord. When Boaz, or when Ruth asked Boaz, why are you showing me this kind of kindness? His response was fascinating to me. His response was, I've, as I've heard, I've heard about what you've done. 
how you care for Naomi. How you made this journey with her. How you've come here with her. How you've given up your family. How you've given up your country, your sense of place. And you've come here with her. That's his response to her. Why are you treating me this way? Because look at what you've done. And, and here's... Then he, then he told her this after that in verse 12. He said, May the Lord repay you for what you've done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. When, when Boaz looks at Ruth, he's aware of who she is, right? He knows she's poor. He knows she's a foreigner. Like He knows these things about her. But I don't think that's what he sees. I think he sees a woman who demonstrated her faith in God by taking care of Naomi and by trusting in God and by coming to Israel with her. His response is that he encourages her to walk with the Lord. He speaks words of blessing over her. Have you taken refuge under the wings of the God of Israel? He's a loving God. He won't leave us or forsake us, he says. Scripture tells us that no one who trusts in Him will ever be put to shame. This is why Jesus came. This is why He was born on Christmas and lived a sinless life and was crucified, buried, and resurrected is to provide us reconciliation with God, to live in a relationship with Him and to come under His protection, to take refuge under God's wings. We we ought to remind each other of that regularly. When, when you see someone, one of your brothers and sisters, in a difficult time, that is the time to remind them that, that they live under the wings of the Almighty. When you don't feel like you're in a place of refuge, you need to be reminded that you're in a place of refuge. Because it doesn't always feel that way, but this is where God is placed. We should remind each other of that, that He protects us and He cares for us. We should encourage each other to keep our eyes on Jesus, to look to Him for our strength. Ruth, I think, was certainly encouraged by what Boaz said. Her response in verse 13 says, "May I, So he says, he tells her, May God repay you, may you be richly rewarded by God under whose wings you've come to take refuge. And she says, May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord. You have put me at ease by speaking kindly your servant, though I don't have the standing even among your servants. She was encouraged. You've put me at ease. Do your words with others put them at ease? A righteous person encourages people in their walk with the Lord. The fourth thing is the righteous person protects and provides. Ruth, or rather Boaz showed Ruth even further kindness, he provided her with a meal for lunch on that first day. It was this roasted grain and and, uh, and the things and the bread and the, the wine vinegar. And so I don't know, like we don't know all the details. This may have been the first really solid meal Ruth's had in a long time. Remember, they left under, uh, she, Naomi and the family left under a famine. They went to Moab. They were the outsiders in Moab. Were they accepted or not? Were they able to do commerce? We don't know a lot of details, but we know that Ruth and Naomi came back to Bethlehem. The town was astir. Were they being well cared for? I mean, not terribly well because she had to go out and glean her grain. So Boaz provides her with lunch. She says it says that she ate all she wanted and that she had some left over. And then Boaz protects her further. He, he, he tells the men uh, to not bother her, to let her do, to let her uh, gather the grain that she wants to gather. Usually, gleaners were only supposed to follow behind and pick up just the stalks that fell on the ground or the ones that were specifically left around the edges. But and she may or may not have known this, but Boaz gave Ruth permission to glean even among the sheaves. Even among the grain that had been gathered, you can have some of that too. Not only that, he tells them that as they're gathering grain, to pull out extra stalks and leave them behind. 
give her some extra to gather. He was incredibly generous in providing for her. Once again, he puts her under his protection. He tells the men not to touch her, not to bother her. He tells them, and I think that's more than just not to physically assault her. I think he's telling them, don't, you don't embarrass her. You don't rebuke to, and he does tell them not to rebuke when, when she's getting grain that she would normally be allowed to get. You don't mess with her. You don't rebuke her. You let her have it. He doesn't want to shame her. He wants to provide for her. And that's what a righteous person does. He protects and provides for others. And then finally, the fifth one, a righteous... God uses a righteous person to bless others. Boaz put God first in his life. He showed kindness to the poor. He encouraged Ruth in her walk with the Lord. He protected her. He provided for her. What was the result? The result was that she worked all day. And when she threshed out the grain that she had gathered, she had a whole ephah of grain. Now, we don't measure things in ephahs a lot anymore. I don't think you can go down to H-E-B and get an ephah of pinto beans or an ephah of you know, corn or something. Um, an ephah was about roughly 30 pounds or so of grain. It's a lot of grain. Ruth, I can imagine, has got a big old sack of barley over her shoulder, making her way slowly back to Naomi. This is enough food, probably it's enough grain for about a month or so. In one day, most gleaners would be happy to come home the commentaries tell us with one or two pounds of grain. But through Boaz, God really provided for her and for Naomi. She's struggling home with this big sack of barley. And not just that. Remember, she had been given this roasted grain for lunch. Well, she took the leftovers home in a doggy bag for Naomi. And so they were able to eat supper together. Naomi, Naomi's the one now who is shocked and astounded. In verse 19, it says, uh, her mother-in-law asked her, where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed is the man who took notice of you. And then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one in whose place she had been working. The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz. She said, Boaz. Now see, this is a name. Naomi recognizes this name. She knows who this is. She may not have known him or remembered him personally, but she knows this name. And so her response, the Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, he's not stopped showing kindness to the living and the dead. That man is our close relative. He's one of our guardian redeemers. He's not stopped showing kindness to the living or the dead. He, I don't know that he, he may have known about the connection with Naomi at this point. I don't, it's hard to say. But, but he knows that Ruth is a widow. He knows Naomi is a widow, and he knows that he's caring for them. So he's not stopped showing kindness to the living or to the dead on behalf of these others, these men who had died. And this is where Naomi introduces the concept of the kinsman redeemer. And it is the key to this whole story. We're going to talk about that next week, like I said. Ruth tells Naomi more good news. That today is not a one of It's not a fluke. It's not a coincidence. Ruth, Boaz has invited her to continue to glean in his fields throughout the rest of the harvest. In verse 23, we find this other blessing. Ruth gleaned in the fields not only for the barley harvest, but for the wheat harvest. The barley harvest lasts about three weeks or so. The wheat harvest comes right on the heels of that. It was about four weeks or so. And apparently, Boaz raised both. Ruth was blessed with seven weeks of work. We talked about work this morning in Sunday school, the value of work beyond the income. This, she was probably able to store up enough grain for the entire year thanks to this. And it's all because of the righteous actions of one person. God uses a righteous man, he uses a righteous person to bless others. Do you want your life to be a blessing to others. Follow God. Follow Jesus. Let God form His righteousness in you. But here's the question. How does this, what does this have to do with Christmas? Because this is really the Christmas story. Well, the Christmas story is also the story 
of a righteous man who offered kindness, protection, and provision to a young woman in her time of need. Remember in Matthew chapter 1, I want to read starting in verse 18. Matthew 1, starting in verse 18, says, This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and he took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. See, Joseph was also a righteous man. Joseph put God first in his life. We see this because of the level of obedience throughout that whole passage. He was kind to Mary when she found out she was pregnant. When he found out she was pregnant, he protected her. He protected her reputation. He was going to put her away by divorce quietly and not shame her. So even before the angel gave him instructions on what to do, he still was going to treat her as fairly as he could possibly treat her. He didn't want to disgrace her publicly. And then when the angel uh, uh, told him, so he took Mary home as his wife and he provided for her just as a husband provides for his wife. The book of Ruth is the story of a righteous man who offered kindness, protection, and provision to a young woman in her time of need, the Christmas story. It's also the story of a man, a righteous man, who provided kindness, protection, and provision for a young woman in her time of need. But the big question, the, the takeaway, how can you be a righteous person? We see Boaz as an example of that, and we see Joseph as an example of that, but we are called to that. And the reality is we can only be righteous through the grace of Jesus. It's only through the grace of God that we become righteous before God. Here's how Paul said it in the book of Philippians chapter 3. Philippians 3 verses 8 and 9 say, What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in Him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I called the message today, Ms. Indy Bullet, that a righteous man. So when it comes down to it, we have an example of Boaz as a righteous man. We have an example of Joseph as a righteous man, but when it comes to Right down to it, there's only one who is truly righteous, and that's Jesus Himself. And so, how do we become righteous? We become righteous through faith in Him. God makes us righteous in His sight. We put our faith in Christ. Through Him, you can be a righteous person who puts God first in your life, a righteous person who shows kindness to the poor, who encourages others in their walk with the Lord, and a righteous person who protects and provides. And I pray that we would be those kind of people, that we would be righteous people, and that God would bless us because of that, and God would bring others to Him because of that. Will you bow your heads with me in prayer? God, thank you for the story of Boaz and Ruth for the story of Joseph and Mary. As we talked about what righteousness looks like and how to demonstrate it and characteristics of righteousness, being a righteous person, I pray that you, through the power of your Spirit, would build that in us, that you would grow that in us, and you would cause us to be those kind of righteous people.
Help us to submit ourselves fully to you. And to find our righteousness solely in you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.